Hello, I'm Eric Snodgrass, and thank you for watching today's Ag Forecast brought to you by Nutrient Ag Solutions, your premier platform for real-time global insights. Well, today is the winter solstice in the Northern Hemisphere, and this is a snapshot yesterday from GO16 as the sun was rising. I just want to draw a line right there to show you where the sunrise is. And then I'll draw another line that'll cut across part of it right in through here. That's the equator. Now, what's neat about this image is that if you draw an arrow perpendicular to the first line I drew right here, the angle between the equator and that line will be 23.5 degrees. And where it hits right over here on the edge of this uh, view of the Earth, I can then draw another line. And that would mark where we have the Tropic of Capricorn, which is 23.5 degrees south. Now, we call this particular day a solstice because it means sun stop. It's the highest the sun will get in the sky in the southern hemisphere today. It's the lowest in the northern hemisphere today. Uh, and after this, we begin to gain daylight hours in the northern hemisphere, and they're lost in the southern hemisphere. We have a seasonal transition. We're now into winter in the northern hemisphere and into summer in the southern hemisphere. But now there's a couple of other neat things going on in this map. I'm going to point out one of them. It's right down here. Do you see that cyclone that is just off the coast of parts of Uruguay and Argentina? It's moving to the east. And behind it, we're going to be talking about what's going to happen in Argentina over the next uh, week plus, as it's going to be extremely dry in that area. And I'll finish this video talking about South America. But first, a bit more on drought. This map here was the latest drought monitor that was updated last Thursday. And overall, not much change from the week before. We have expansive drought across the western United States, and a lot of questions we're trying to answer this winter is, what do we expect this to do as we approach spring? So first thing I want to do here is I'm going to take a look at a time series produced by the folks that create the drought monitor at the University of Nebraska at Lincoln. And what you've got here on the y-axis is the percent of the area across the continental United States covered in drought. I'm going to put a line right here at the 60th percentile. You see, when I looked historically, there's a few interesting things here. Notice that every time we've kind of broken that plane, uh, here it is in summer of 2002, summer of 2003, summer of 2006, summer of 2007, and then uh, summer of 2012, even again in summer of 2013. Since then, breaking that plane has happened here as we uh, went out of winter uh, 2017 into 2018. So winter 2017, 2018. And right now, as we go from winter in 2020 into 2021. Now, you notice previously it was a lot of summertime that the drought was most expansive. But we've had these recent two time periods where it has been peaking uh, at winter. And the question is, right over here, look at the very end of the graph. Is it another peak here? In other words, is it going to go down? Are we going to see this drought expand throughout winter? And that's an important question that I'm continuing to research, and I'm looking forward to sharing with you my results in the next couple of videos here. First of all, though, when we look back at the January through November 2020 precipitation rank, it's interesting seeing such expansive drought, yet our number for the whole country is right here near average. And that's because when you break it down by state, parts of the southeast getting over to the mid-Atlantic had their very, very wet. One state, North Carolina, the wettest year on record. And then go back to the west, look at Utah, the driest, California, third driest. So it's important that we see the disparity across the country in terms of the haves and have-nots for precipitation. Now, over the last week, we can see that even better. Much of the Midwest getting up into the Northern Plains, getting down to parts of Texas and then over toward the Southwest, very, very dry. But with the big blizzard that cranked through the Northeast and then the weekend rainfall that moved from the lower Mississippi River Valley, which this morning is finally moving off the East Coast, some pockets there have been uh, very wet. To show you that snowfall, this was just kind of putting this last snowstorm uh, to bed here. We can see that there it was a corridor. Look at this right in through this area where we had between 20 and 40 plus inches of snowfall. And that was a bit farther to the west and north than some of the models had initially been forecasting. And that's a well-known model bias that they tend to be too far to the south and east whenever there's a big area of high pressure sitting over parts of Quebec. But still, a, a very sizable region in here that got at least a foot of snow from this last uh, weekend system. Now, as we go into the forecast, I'd like to point out four things about the jet stream pattern that are critical. One, we're going to start in the tropics. See this here? That's actually the top of the Walker cell, which is part of the El Nino La Nina or the Southern Oscillation pattern. These winds here are beginning to weaken. That's important. I think the La Nina is trying to make its last big push as we begin the new year. Secondly, that seems to have allowed by the time we get out at the end of this week for some sense of flow coming out of the south and west into Southern California.
which means early next week, the chances for some precipitation there start to increase, and that's an area that's been very dry. Third, can you just see that overall the jet stream wind pattern, if I kind of follow it, does something like that? In other words, it's more of a trajectory that's moving toward the south as it moves from the Pacific to the Atlantic, except for right here, where we see this large ridge and almost blocked flow setting up in the Atlantic, forming what we call the negative phase of the North Atlantic Oscillation. The question is, is it temporary or does it stay there for a while? Now, putting all that together, this is going to spell a, a, another relatively active next week plus for the East Coast, as you can see here, quite active. Quite a bit of snow went through this corridor, but with the return of some southwesterly flow here, we could be increasing our precipitation chances excuse me, there, and also start to bring in precip from the southern plains uh, to the northern plains with a very active pattern as we finish up December and then start to get into January. So there's change happening here, and it's not only happening in precipitation, it's happening in temperature, and I'm going to talk to you about that in a few moments. But I'm going to show you the change by going right to the upper levels of the atmosphere. Let's animate this view of the northern hemisphere here with our trough ridge pattern. So first of all, first trough begins to exit throughout this week, and it's going to take with it the cooler weather to the east, but behind it, see the ridge that's building into place? A major warm-up in the midsection of the country for the beginning of the week. But this active pattern, look at the trough that slices in here on the 23rd and the 24th. And I'll show you what this does in terms of precip, including snowfall, as it comes cutting through into the northeast here on Christmas Day. That's a pretty deep trough. After that, into the weekend we go, we start to see two things happening. Look at the ridge building up toward Greenland. That is a pretty sizable block, and it's setting off a highly amplified pattern, both in the downstream direction and also in the upstream. And we're going to see here on Sunday this trough take shape just off the California coast, which is going to be far enough to the south to really be bringing in our chances of precipitation in Southern California. But notice this too. By next Monday, we're also going to have a system coming through the southeast. And as I just play this, you continue to see the atmosphere sending systems through this direction. So with that as our setup, let's go on into the near-term forecast here. We're going to go right over to the high-resolution NAM. You're going to see the precip exiting overnight here into early this morning from the first system uh, and the next one moving in behind it. So where is that? There's a weak low that's kind of clipping here through parts of North Dakota, Minnesota, getting to Wisconsin and Michigan. And we're going to have some light snow around that today as we work our way throughout the day. Meanwhile, we do have a frontal boundary that cuts into parts of the Pacific Northwest here. And we're going to watch this later on this week as it forms into a low in the middle part of the country. But first things first, by this afternoon, you see the scattered snow showers here getting over to parts of Ohio, Pennsylvania, and West Virginia. Now from there, as we work our way into the overnight hours, again, first system is kind of curling on off to the north and east. It's a relatively weak one here, just some scattered snow. But as we get into the day on Tuesday, see the low beginning to come through parts of Montana, spread snow through southern Alberta up into parts of southern Saskatchewan. And then as we get into Tuesday afternoon, this low is now fully formed. Now on the back side, there's a lot of cold air here, and you're going to see the snow spreading in this area. But out ahead of it, strong southerly winds and a major warm-up is on tap, and I'll show you that in a few moments. But as we go through the overnight hours, you see then by 6 a.m. on Wednesday, the main frontal boundary will be cutting right here, basically from the Quad Cities all the way down to this part of Texas and Oklahoma. Now from there, the question will be, is the cold air coming in fast enough to turn this over to snow? And to get that answer, we got to go over to the European model. So let's play up until that point right there, Wednesday afternoon. You can see how strong these winds are. So with the snow flying back here, we could have at times very, very poor visibility on Wednesday afternoon with the snow and the strong winds. The front is right here in the kink in the isobars, high pressure over the East Coast feeding this with moisture, and you're going to see what that does. Ready? Here's Wednesday afternoon to the evening, getting into the overnight hours on Wednesday into Thursday, and there's going to be some heavy rain down here in the lower Mississippi River Valley, and then possibly a changeover to snow behind that front. So you can see it right in through here. Going from Thursday morning here into the afternoon, we could be bringing some of that snow through parts of Ohio down into Tennessee and Kentucky, right in through this area, and into the Great Lakes, some stronger winds on the back side of this. But as we work our way into now Thursday night and then Christmas morning, that snow begins to spread. I'll kind of rock back and forth here over some of the areas that just got quite a bit of precip. 
Now, the problem is if we bring in this rain out ahead of it with the, I mean, there's a big warm up toward the end of this week here for the Northeast. This is going to make for some really, really slushy conditions that then get turned over to ice after this moves through with some snow, fresh snow on top of it. The lake effect snow will be going here on Friday, the 25th. And we'll see that behind that, some higher pressure builds in, calming things down for the beginning of the weekend here in the midsection of the country. But remember what I told you, the next troughs start kicking in. The first one cuts through the northwest. Look at the snow coming in through here and the rain getting farther to the south on Saturday. But it's actually once we get into here on Sunday night that we have the trough coming into parts of Southern California and the next one forming here over parts of Missouri, Arkansas, Southern Illinois, Tennessee, Kentucky, that region. Ready? So those two lows much farther to the south move through on Monday. So that gets us out one full week. You can see the pattern very, very active here. Putting it all together, let's look for the areas that are not getting much precipitation. You can see that through this next week, just the next seven days out to next Sunday night, that area really missing out on quite a bit of this precip. But over the southeast, adding quite a bit more rain in through here and same thing in the northeast with that system coming through at the end of this week, a lot of liquid in there. And remember, it's gonna be a switch over to snow after it passes through. But you can see the evidence of the increased chances of precipitation once we get out to Monday, Tuesday of next week, getting into Southern California. Total snowfall from the European model. Notice here along this section with the system that comes through at the end of this week, better chances of increasing the snowfall and also with the lake effect. But overall, when you look at this, let's just kind of pick up on the pattern and try to understand who has the chance of picking up snow by the time we get out to next Sunday evening. Maybe a better way to do that is just to say this. We have this much snow coverage on the ground right now, so in white, and then the probability of adding another inch between now and next Friday night is shown here. So interesting to see here that parts of the plains getting into Kansas, Missouri, Illinois, uh, not seeing a good chance, but get down here to Tennessee, Kentucky over here as you approach the Appalachian Mountains, much better chance of seeing another inch of snow being picked up here. So that's kind of, I guess, your answer to the question of who's got a good chance of seeing a white Christmas. But the week after that, look at this jet stream pattern. Highly amplified in its movement. Troughs are cutting through, and as they do so, we're going to see a very active pattern. And as they take you all the way out to the first week of January, the models are advertising very strong jet stream flow here across the Gulf of Alaska. Troughs slicing through, kind of just cutting into the midsection of the United States. With a big ridge that's building here, the negative NAO sets up. And watch what that does to our precipitation pattern first. So you can see the flow coming in, active in the midsection of the country, active in the northeast. So it looks like a wet end to 2020 and start of 2021. But we need to talk about what's going on with those temperatures now. So looking at the same way we did at the beginning of the video, January to November this year, uh, Florida, uh, Virginia, Maryland, Delaware, Rhode Island, all warmest on record. But much of the rest of the country having a warm year here. But the beginning of December, at least through the first three weeks, has favored very warm conditions across the northern tier with cooler than average weather across the south. Now, where is it going? Well, broad scale warmth here in the midsection of the country today on those strong southerly winds. And this is just going to translate to the east by the time we get in here in today on Tuesday. Yeah, I mean, it's December 22nd and we've got potentially upper 50s, lower 60s on strong southerly winds here. But you know the system that comes through on Wednesday, there it is. Now we're dropping those temperatures off 30 degrees, 40 degrees here from what they were on Tuesday, and the warmth translates to the east. Now as that system really takes shape on Thursday, very cold air settles in behind it here on Christmas Eve, and then look at the warm up for the Northeast. Uh, with When you get this, by the way, and the temperatures drop off, you're gonna have two problems. One is gonna be a caking of ice on that snow that tried to melt, and two is gonna be a lot of fog. So prepare for a lot of fog in the Northeast. And then the cold air slices in behind it here on Friday. This is Christmas Day. There's your high temperatures forecast for Christmas Day. And as we go from there into Saturday, and Sunday, the colder air finally moves to the east. Now we've got some interesting things taking shape as we finish up the month of December. Day five through 10, with the ridge building over Greenland, the negative NAO starts to show us the cooler weather across the east with the exiting system at the end of this week, okay? Both models suggest it. But there will be some changes when you look out here in the day 10 through 15. I expect a lot of volatility in these maps. 
And this is the reason why I think the temperature pattern for January is going to be much different than it was for uh, the month of, of December. And you can start to see that here by watching the stratospheric polar vortex, which is quite strong right now, begin to start to have these intrusions of some ridges on the, well, we could call that that, that side or maybe the western side uh, of, of the polar stratospheric vortex. Notice this. Come right over here. This is what the vortex is supposed to do by Friday. Increase in strength and then subsequently in the next week fall back off once again, possibly to the lowest strength it's had so far uh, this winter. Now from there, let me show you what this is going to do. On the left, I have day 10. So this is getting out to the 31st. Look at the size of that ridge bumping up here in the stratosphere. It is beginning to weaken the polar vortex and potentially start to break it into two separate pieces. That's what the European says. Here's the GFS. And the operational GFS actually runs out in extra five days. And the ridge pushes in and splits this. Look at this. Right here, one piece going into this direction, the other one cutting off over here. And that could be a, a more significant disruption of this polar vortex um, to, to possibly perturb things into January and give us a good shot at some really cold air across parts of North America. The GFS extended is beginning to see it. It's starting to let that cold air out into this area as we work our way into the middle of January. But it may take that long for this disruption to really manifest itself in the troposphere. So I just want you to watch out for it. You're going to hear a lot of meteorologists talking about the disruptions in the polar vortex. But I think the tropics are a critical piece to this as well. We have a very strong trade wind burst right here. So that's out of the east. And it's meeting strong westerlies here, right over about phase seven going toward phase eight. Now those tend to correlate with cooler weather in this area, but I want to be talking about South America with this change in the tropics. Because looking at these time series, which I'm trying to do every Monday, we're now looking at about a 15 inch deficit in Mato Grosso, Brazil's central and northern growing area. It's the driest we have there, at least in the last six years. And we can now count four notable dry time periods, the late start to the monsoon, early November, late November, and then this last week has been quite dry. Let's go south of there. When you get down into Mato Grosso, Parna, and Rio Grande do Sul, that's the area now I'm now analyzing. When you compare 2020 to the previous five years, it's now the driest overall in that region. But there are some pockets of embedded drought that I've seen some pictures from that are really showing some, some damage to some of the crops. But unlike other places, there are some wet regions in there as well, as you can see in the CPC map over on the right. Finally, let's go to Argentina. I verified this this morning by looking at some of the data from the Argentinian Meteorological Service. And you do see when you look at the station data that over here, like toward Cordoba in this area, there are pockets that have been quite dry. But as you get over to Brazil, excuse me, Argentina's eastern area here and northern, I'll kind of shade that in. There are some places that have been wet and there's been better precipitation over toward Buenos Aires in some of those areas as well. Now, why I illustrate that is because remember what I started the video with? The next week is very dry in Argentina, very dry in Uruguay, very dry in Paraná. In fact, the models are not picking up on any precipitation, while it's expected to be much wetter than average in Brazil's central and northern growing areas. So much wetter than average, possibly somewhere over an inch to an inch and a half of excess precipitation. From there, look at this. This is some brand new update and a weekend trend I can't ignore. You see, if, if you would have looked at these same maps, uh, on Friday, the wetter conditions extended farther to the north. Now they're sitting right here and farther to the south. See that? So this area has gone over toward a drier trend in the model, a drier trend in the model with wetter farther to the south. We're going to keep an eye on Argentina as well moving forward as there is a pocket here that's forecast to be drier with the wetter conditions much farther to the west. Last map I'm going to show you. I look forward to giving you an update on this one later this week. It was from last Thursday, looking at the month of January. And what I want to see is, in the newest model updates, is this the region that stays wet or does that expand? That's what's going to be critical in trying to understand. And we'll put it all together for you and present it to you later this week. Have a good one. We'll talk to you again soon. Thank you.